It's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Deputy Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda to the Washington University School of Law. Two days ago, she received the World Peace Through Law Award for 2011 from the Whitney Harris World Law Institute for her extraordinary work in the field of international criminal justice and her many achievements as a lawyer even before coming to the ICC. Uh, today, we'd like to explore a little bit about Prosecutor Bensouda's background, her life, her work, how she got to where she is now, what future challenges uh, she expects going forward, and maybe a couple words of advice to our young women lawyers and men lawyers who would like to work in the field of international criminal justice or simply in the field of international law. Thank you so much, Fatou, for coming to Washington University. Thank you. Thank you, Leila, for having me. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here and a wonderful experience. These past few days have been great. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, our students, our faculty, everybody's been thrilled. We hear that there's a lot of buzz on campus about your visit, <laughs> and I understand you've been photographed on many cell phones <laughs> with many different students. Thanks. So thank you for putting up with yet another intervention. Um, if you wouldn't mind talking to us a little bit about your career prior to going to the ICC and mm -hmm. maybe even prior to going to the Rwanda Tribunal, because you mm -hmm. had a very rich career in the Gambia, your yeah. native country. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, I, I started off my career, um, as you rightly said, in the Gambia. Um, I did my high school um, education in the Gambia, um, but it was a time that uh, the Gambia had already not started um, having professional um, a university teaching professional courses like law and medicine and so on. And uh, what would happen is at the end of your high school, um, you qualify to go to one of the Commonwealth countries mm. if you wanted to do law. And uh, I qualified and uh, I went to Nigeria. I actually chose to go to Nigeria. Mm. Um, and uh, that's where I studied law. That's also where I did my law school. Um, but even before going to Nigeria and making the choice to do law, it is something that has always been with me, I think, mm. from very early on. And I remember that even at high school, after school, I used to run up to the law courts just to, you know, really? look, at, look at what they were doing. And uh, I had this fascination and also this conviction, you know, very early on that this is my, my, my career path. And I've not looked back and I've not changed it since. So from, from Nigeria, when I came back, I was appointed as public prosecutor. And uh, I stayed with the, with the Ministry of Justice, um, where I worked and I rose through the ranks. Um, I had become, I, I became, after public prosecutor, I was a state counsel. I have been a senior state counsel, a principal state counsel, deputy director of public prosecutions, um, solicitor general and legal secretary, and also attorney general and legal secretary, that's where it stopped. I had nowhere else to go in the <laughs> ministry. So um, that's when I went into private practice, which I did for a couple of uh, years, uh, not long, because um, I, I just have the passion for, for prosecution, you know, and I remain focused with that. So when I did some little private practice and also worked as a general manager of a bank, um, then I went back. To, to private practice. I was appointed, I mean, I went back to um, public prosecutions again. I was appointed by the Rwanda Tribunal as a, a trial attorney and legal advisor, you know, doubling us both. Initially in Kigali, where I worked very closely with the um, investigators and also with the victims and witnesses. Um, in, in my um, um, uh, then assignment as an as a legal advisor advising the investigators. And uh, from there I went to Arusha. I was appointed in Arusha again, or transferred to Arusha, where both as legal advisor, I also doubled up as a trial attorney. And I was mainly in the military one case. I had done some uh, work in the media case, which was almost nearing completion. But I worked with Steve Rapp, 
um, uh, um, in the in the media case, and then again with Barbara Mulvaney in the uh, military one case, and. Uh, um, it was actually during, because the case took some time. Yeah. In fact, yeah. even after I left the ICC, ICTR, it was still on. And it was just last year, beginning mm. of last year or so, that we had a judgment in that case. So during the time that I was in the ICTR, I worked on several projects. And uh, finally, I was um, elected in 2004 as the Deputy Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Mm. What yeah. a fantastic yeah. cursus. Yeah. When you were posted to Kigali, what was it like to work in a country that had recently experienced a genocide? Um, Leila, it's an experience that um, sometimes I think that going from the national system mm. and moving to international uh, criminal prosecutions, even though you were a prosecutor with maybe um, quite some accomplishments in at, the, at that level, nothing really prepares you mm -hmm. for that. And by that, I'm not talking about, you know, you're not ready as a prosecutor, but you, you, you're there to deal with massive crimes, mm -hmm. you know, of, of thousands of perpetrators, you know, of millions of victims, mm -hmm. you know, of, of issues that at the national level really is, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing. So this is what you're confronted with. And when you deploy to the field where actually the crimes have taken place, you know, where invariably every other person is either part of the perpetrators or a victim mm -hmm. of some sort. Because some, in almost every family that you come across in Rwanda, you know, you would find a victim. Right. of the genocide. So this was big. This was big for me. And initially, um, I can say that it probably was a little bit difficult, you know, mm -hmm. just having to process it, you know, live with it. And uh, also wanting, having this desire to do so much, mm -hmm. you know, f to address this and knowing that you can't do everything, yeah. you know. So this, 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 is, this is something that really you have to be able to adjust to you know, in the end. Uh, but I always say that whatever that I had to go through as a prosecutor or even as an advisor to the investigators, I mean, it's nothing compared to what the victims go through. Sure. So if you look at it from that angle, you know, this is something that can keep you going. Yeah. yeah it keeps Did you, you ever going. feel threatened? I know that Kigali was insecure yeah. for Louise Arbor had told me that uh, yeah. quite a while ago, that it wasn't very safe for the ICTR investigators. And yeah. Did you ever feel threatened personally? You know, I, I never really thought about it. Mm. Um, because, you, you know, you're there, you're so involved in what you're trying to do day to day. Mm. You know, what you're trying to get. You're trying to look for the evidence. That sometimes, really, the last thing on your mind is your personal security. Mm. You know, but... Occasionally, um, the, the, uh, uh, those who were responsible for that were constantly reminding us mm -hmm. that we needed to take certain steps, you know, just for our own security. Of course, the security of those who speak to us is, is paramount, yes. you know, but if you don't have anybody to talk to about this, then it's also counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, our own security um, uh, apparel who were talking to us and telling us this is good for you to do these areas you cannot go to you know at this time you should not be out and 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 things like that so and also the premises where we stayed was very secured it was secured. It, it was secured and when we were to to look for accommodation anywhere you know we had to go through a certain um, questioning and test and seeing that whether this is a place that you could actually stay yeah you know because let's face it you know those who were convinced that they had to perpetrate these crimes were still living with, with that conviction yeah and the if they had an opportunity to do something to stop those who are investigating the crimes they would do it yeah that's for sure yeah did you lose any, any witnesses while you were in Rwanda? I know there were some witnesses at the ICTR that yeah. were killed. Yeah. Not many, but there yeah. were a few. Did you know any of them? Or? 
Were any in your cases? In fact, it was, I think, just probably just after I left. Okay. You know, just after I left that uh, I learned that there were some witnesses who, after returning back to Rwanda, unfortunately were killed. Mm. You know, and uh, this, was, this was actually very unfortunate because one thing I do know that while we were in ICTR, I know that a lot of effort was made for the security of the witnesses. A lot of effort was put into that and there was a whole system of how we should be um, um, able to also play our role in protecting you know, those who come. But I guess it can never be foolproof and uh, they will always find a way yeah, you know, because you've get to spoken them. about that many times at the yeah. ICC, how important it is to protect oh, yes. your witnesses oh, yes. and, and oh, the yes. victims. Oh yes, you know, with the with the ICC, um, I think it's even more uh, profound. Mm. Everywhere it is, but the fact that if you look at the ICC statute, you know, it puts an obligation on the prosecutor, mm. on the judges, mm. you know, on the registry. To, to make sure that uh, uh, these witnesses, you know, these victims are protected. To protect it is, them. It is an obligation under the statute. So this is something that, uh, a role that in the office of the prosecutor, we take very, very seriously. You know, we'd be, we just don't compromise at all on it. Mm. You know, because I, I always say that if we can have a case and bring it to court, you know, in the name of justice, is because of those who tell us the stories, mm -hmm. you know. And already those who tell, of the tell us the stories, most of them have already gone through quite a lot, mm -hmm. you know. And just coming forward to give us the story, to have um, a case, is courageous on mm -hmm. their part. Mm -hmm. So I do not think that they deserve to also go through another trauma, yeah. you know. And the, therefore, their security their protection is paramount. You, you cannot joke with that. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really quite astonishing when you yeah. think how dependent these courts are on eyewitness testimony yes. from these very fragile and traumatized yeah. individuals. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is the nature of the conflicts. Of right. course, what we have also been trying to do over time is to, to make sure that as much as possible, we use less people, mm. you know, to, to, to come forward and, and, uh, and be live witnesses or give us their stories. We try to rely on documents. Mm. We try to re rely on other sources of evidence mm. than uh, uh, just witnesses. But however minimal, you know, however minimal we, we sometimes, because of the nature of the conflicts, because of knowing what these, the victims go through, you know, we do have these witnesses that we talk to you know, who talk to us, who give us their stories that we bring before the chamber. And uh, as I said, it's absolutely important that we don't expose those who speak to us. Yeah. You know, we don't. Fatou, you've told me a little bit about how you got to the ICC <laughs> from the ICTR. Would, yeah. you, would you mind sharing that story again? Because yeah. at the time that you went to the ICTR, you probably didn't think about going to the ICC. That is correct. That is correct. I did, I did not think about going to the ICC, even though I know that, um, you know, it is, uh, I had been going to, to New York, the, to, you know, the preparatory mm -hmm. meetings. And I was aware, I knew about the, you know, establishment of the ICC um, and all that. I knew about the Rome Conference. Unfortunately, I could not, you know, attend it. A, a colleague of mine went there. But I was at the ICTR and I remember I was just preparing for uh, a witness, I think, in, in court. And a colleague of mine came to me. I was in my office and then she said that, you know, did you see that the ICC has advertised for the deputy prosecutor? I think you fit the profile. I think you should do it. I think you should apply. I said, okay, okay. Can I finish my witness? <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see I'm busy here? Let me do this. It's important. And she left and she came back. And she said that I really think that you should apply. There is a deadline. I think you should apply. I said, please. You know, she left again and came with another colleague, <laughs> you know, who said, no, Fatou, I've been talking, we've been talking about it, and we think you have the perfect profile for this. You've done it, you should, 
So I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. I promise I'll do it, but let me do what I'm doing now. And when they left, after I finished what I was doing, I, I just applied. And uh, I think the following day, I got a call from the ICC, uh, Office of the Prosecutor, and uh, the person said, are you Fatou Ben Souda? I said, yes. And uh, um, she said, um, you applied for the position of Deputy Prosecutor. I said, yes, I have. And you know, all the time I thought it's the normal application. So you apply, you go, you're interviewed, and that's it. <laughs> you know? And then the person said, are you ready for an interview? I said, yes, thinking that it's in some weeks or some days. And I said, yes, of course, when? And the person goes, now. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, can I get into my apartment? Because I was just coming from the office. And this was, actually, this was after seven in the evening. I remember that. So I did the preliminary interview and then, you know, we, we did the rest. But it wasn't the conventional type of job, mm. you know, because according to the statute, the prosecutor has to come up with three names. And it is those three names that he would submit to the Assembly of States Parties mm -hmm. and uh, will be voted, you know, to, to the position. So um, in the end, I had to go, go to New York. You know, I had to meet uh, many different groups, you know, like the African group, the Western European and other groups, the Latin American group, the Asian group, you know, at different times. And they were all asking me questions. I had to meet the coalition of the, the NGOs, mm -hmm. you know, to um, talk about why I thought I should fit the profile. And, you know, it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, sometimes I would go back to the hotel. And I, said, I, I said, I don't know what I have done. I just thought this was a simple thing. Why is all this happening? You know, but uh, yeah, in the end, uh, there was uh, the elections in which um, three of the candidates, the final candidates, there was a lady from New Zealand and there was another lady, a gentleman from Fiji. Mm. And at that Assembly of States parties, I remember that 78 countries were present and voting. Mm -hmm. And I had 58 out of the 78. That's fantastic. So that, that was, yeah. It should make you feel rightfully very proud. Yes, it did. Yeah. It, did. it did. And as Deputy Prosecutor of the Court, what have been some of your greatest challenges? Um, I think one of, one of, um, one of my main challenges, um, of course, is trying to make sure that I have the right, you know, right team mm. for, you know, the work at hand. Right. And, uh, this can mean the investigations from the investigation stage right up to prosecution and the, the team that I would present mm -hmm. that will, mm -hmm. you know, lead the lead the um, case, present the case to the judges. Um, I have always thought that, you know, it has to be the perfect and most efficient team that has to present uh, the case before the judges. And uh, it's not always that um, you can just and quickly pick out the team you want because people are coming from different uh, um, Mm. areas, different backgrounds, they come with, uh, um, not, not uh, everybody comes without maybe some problems from where they're coming up that's affecting whether you can stay, how long you can stay. So even that, you know, becomes, uh, um, has been one of the, one of the major challenges. But another, another thing also that um, um, I, I, I see that over the years um, is, Sometimes it's state cooperation, mm. you know, cooperating, you know, um, as, the, as the deputy, um, opening the doors to get the cooperation that we need to start the investigations, you know, deploy to the field and be able to construct our case and, and, and take it to court. Um, when it's not forthcoming, it is quite a challenge. When it is forthcoming, um, you also have these uh, big issues of witness protection, you know, in the field. How do you approach your witnesses? How do you talk to them without exposing them? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get your safe sites where you can talk to them? Is it uh, um, wise to just do it in the country 
or do you have to do it outside of the country? Mm. So these are, these are some challenges that you have to think about carefully. And what we have tried to do over the years is to um, put out our, our operational procedures, you know, standard operating procedures, some strategies which you think that over the years we have developed, which we think that helps, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in trying to get this, trying to get it done in the most efficient way. Because that too is, is important, to move, to move as efficiently as possible. And that may include speed or, or deciding to wait. Mm. It depends on what is, what, is, what is happening. So, but I think that we have been able, able so far to develop some operating procedures which I think are now helping us. You know, but initially this, this could be quite, it could be quite a challenge. Now you've for just us. finished your first case, the Lubanga case, the yeah. prosecution has mm -hmm. rested, yeah. the defense has rested. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that first case? Is it a relief to have it over? Are you excited about the judgment? Do you feel good? Are yeah. there things you would have done differently? Yeah. Um, Lubanga was the first case of, mm -hmm. uh, of the ICC. And obviously we have gone, we were going through uh, some uncharted waters. Mm. Um, we had quite a few issues that have not been dealt with, even at the ad hoc tribunals, mm -hmm. where you can say that they've provided us with quite a few pre precedents. Uh, the issue of victim participation, yes. you know, was quite novel yes. for, for, the, for an international court. And uh, even though I always say it's a right of the victims, we had to deal with it, but at the same time, the modalities of participation is something that had to be, you know, worked out by the chambers. Yes. You know, and, and uh, to protect and, the rights of the defense. And to prote protect the rights of the defense. They right. were all uh, things that we had to um, um, deal with. Hmm. Um, but in the end, um, issues of disclosure. Right. You know, also right. became a big thing, as a big you know. Thing. <laughs> a big thing. It almost derailed yeah. your case yes. completely. Yeah. But in the end, I think um, what I am happy about is that. All of these issues have been given the consideration it deserves. Mm. That's, that, that I am happy with. Mm. Maybe I, I was quite disappointed or maybe even upset when Lubanga was stayed for the first time. Yeah. You know. But in the end, I said that I understood or I appreciated the fact that judges also have a role to play. They have decisions to make. They have to ensure that the proceedings are fair. Right. And this is what they did. Right. This is what they did. Even though maybe the prosecution <laughs> felt, what are they doing? What is this? But this is what you know, they did. And I think that it has um, sent a message about the court, mm. you know, that we will do things seriously. That it's serious. Yeah, that it's a serious institution. It will look at everything. It will look at only, not only what the prosecution is saying, but it will guard the rights of the defense. Mm. And this is an important statement to make. Yeah. You know, so uh, in the end, uh, we had all these staggers, but I think it was for the right reasons in yeah. the end. And I am looking forward to the, to the judgment, of course. Uh, it's a decision that judges have to make. Mm -hmm. But what I've always said is that um, as the prosecution, as leading the prosecution, I am comfortable, I am actually satisfied with the evidence that we've presented before the judges. And you feel yeah. good about your team, that you put forth the good evidence and that the, the I court feel, should find... Uh, I feel good about the, the team. I feel good about the fact that we stuck together mm. and uh, in spite of all the difficulties that we had in the case, the, the, the team struggled on together mm. and supported each other. Mm. And all the evidence that we had gathered, that we had worked on to, to, to present, was presented in the way that we had planned. Mm. You know, so I think for me, this, is, uh, this was important. And I think that other teams uh, have learned a lot from, the, from this first Lubanga It's hard team. to be first, isn't it? it? Has, it's very hard to be first, yeah. you know, but other yeah. teams are learning some of the mistakes that I think we have uh, committed in, in the first case will definitely not be repeated, <laughs> has definitely not been repeated in the second cases. And I see that, uh, let's say, with Katanga and mm. Gujo, Katanga and Gujolo, with Bemba, you know, Tachud, 
we are proceeding, <laughs> proceeding very well, and even at a much, much faster pace than we did in Lubanga. Much faster. Yeah, much, much faster pace. Now, Lubanga was a case about child <coughs> soldiers. Was there any particular story mm -hmm. that stays with you, any of the witnesses or victims that you interviewed or whose yeah. testimony really sticks yeah. uh, for you or um, stands out? The, there were many stories, mm. Leila, that really would, you know, it's, it's, you can't make a choice sometimes. Yeah. You yeah. can't make a choice because mm -hmm. I think all of the stories of these children mm. was horrific, mm. horrific. They had to go through a lot. Sometimes when you have to listen to one of them telling you that um, I woke up, either I was going to school with my brother or I was playing football with my brother. And then this van came and you know picked us up, collected us. And maybe a couple of years later is when mm -hmm. you know they will be released you know, after being trained uh, to how to fight, how to assemble weapons, how to act as spies, how to fight at the battlefront. Mm. So mm. all of them, you know, have a similar story to mm. tell you. Um, there is though one particular story that um, really has, uh, has stuck with me. And this is about uh, a girl, a girl soldier a girl soldier who, um, and maybe it was a good thing we brought this, the, this dimension. Because you will recall, Leila, that when we um, did the uh, Lubanga case, when we brought the Lubanga charges, there was this criticism that yes, there was. it's too narrow. You know, why are you, uh, you have murder, you have pillages, you have all sorts of other serious crimes mm -hmm. and you bring child soldiers. Um, but in the end, and with the evidence of, uh, that we have received from these witnesses, what we have been able to show is the gender dimension, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the crimes that these, of child soldiers. Right. Uh, because at the end of the day, when they are abducted, okay, we don't take it as a serious crime. I, of course, I have a different view. But these children are abducted, and they are taken to camps. Mm you know, as soldiers. And mind you, these children are either nine years, yeah. 10 years, some are even eight years. They're taken to camps. You know, they're shaved. Mm. Sometimes, in some instances, when it's really brutal, before they leave, either their family members are killed in their presence, mm. or they are asked to kill their family members in their presence. That is a way of initiating them. Off they go to the camp, and they are trained as soldiers at that age. Imagine your child yeah, at exactly. that age, you know, being treated as a soldier, given a weapon. Initially, they are given a stick to fight. Later on, it's turned to a weapon when, when you get, you know, really uh, qualified. And um, in that process, killings, when you go out to the battlefield, you know, you get killed, you can kill, your friends get killed in your presence, mm. and no matter what, you have to be strong and continue to fight. Um, girls maybe suffer the worst mm. because they go through all of that. They go through all of that. And why this witness, this particular witness, sticks with me is that they explain this process, but also they explain when they, when they are in the camp, how these commanders mm. repeatedly rape them. Yeah. They take them as wives. Mm -hmm. They take them as sex slaves. If they refuse to be raped, they are killed. Mm -hmm. Or they are put in prison. And what is that prison? It's a big hole dug in the ground, mm -hmm. uncovered. And they stay there for days. Mm -hmm. They are the cooks. They are the spies. You know, they go through a lot. And a lot of murder, killings is committed, you know, in the life of a child soldier. They are taught to steal because they go out and pillage. Right. You know, they go out and, and kidnap women older than themselves, the young boys, to bring to the commanders to be raped in the, in the camps. So this is a life yeah. of, a, of a child soldier. And if you tell me that, you know, these charges are narrow, or maybe they are not so important as killing, or as, uh, it, it really worries me. Yeah. It really worries me. Well, it destroys a whole yeah. generation. It, it destroys a whole yeah. generation of children. Yeah. You know, and in the end, 
it affects the children so much that some of them feel um, when you take them back, when you demobilize them, actually, mm. when you take them back to normal life, this is, uh, they're apprehensive of living a normal life. Mm. They want to go back. And some of them have run back to go to the militia because that's where they're comfortable. Yeah, that's what it's they like know. you take a normal child here living a normal life to the bush. Mm. They try to escape to go back. So for them, living in the bush and doing this stuff is what they know, mm. you know. And when you take them back to the villages, they want to go back. Mm. But what happens to the girl child is even worse because most of these demobilization programs don't think of them as soldiers, mm. you know. They, they, even though they fight at the battle fr front, when they are demobilizing them, girls are left out because maybe they, they're thought of as perhaps the cooks right. Right. and not as soldiers. Yeah. So it's... it's Many a life, I can tell you, taking the example of the Democratic Republic of Congo, many a life in this uh, generation have been seriously affected. Mm. Seriously affected. You know, and also whilst they are in these camps, they sometimes give them drugs. And this is to numb, you know, the, the pain or whatever, right. yeah. They, some tell you that, oh, when I take it, I get more, you know, I can do things that I, I, I will not be able to do when I don't take them. And what happens is the consequence of this is they become addicts. Mm. And we have had that example. We've had those examples in which children, by the time you demobilize them, they're so addicted to some of these drugs that they cannot do anything else. Is the Victim and Witnesses <coughs> Unit able to help them with medical care or rehabilitation? They or are. Uh, they are, therapy? Yes, they are. Yeah. The victims and, and witnesses units are, um, are helping, you know, with the, with the children, especially mm. um, those who we, we have already spoken to. But sometimes uh, these children themselves, because maybe they are so much, perhaps sometimes addicted, that we put them in a program and they run away. Mm. You know, they run away because that's, that's, what they yeah, know. that's what they know. That's what they know. That's what they know. So yeah. what keeps you motivated to continue? This is such a, a difficult problem yeah. that you're tackling. What keeps you motivated personally to get up every day and do what you do? Um, I always say that, you know, the stories of the victims is mm. much more stronger and bigger than myself. Mm. Much more. Mm. You know, I... Uh, I, I think I have always been convinced, even at the national level, that I can contribute, you know, to however little, mm. however humble, you know, because I think it takes one person, you know, to say that I can do something, right. to have a group of person yeah. to do something, yeah. you know, and I, don't, I know that I am not alone in this. Mm. Um, there are so many others out there, including yourself, <laughs> Leia, who are committed to this yeah. and who will do everything they can, yeah. you know, to ensure that these uh, people, these victims, those, uh, those who do not have a voice, really, will have a voice. Will have a voice. Will have a voice. And do you have any advice for a young person who'd like to get into this field? Um, what advice would you give them? I mean, the first thing that I would say is that it's, it's, it's very good to have the passion for it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's important, you know, to have the passion and to be convinced, you know, that what you're going to do is to, to help, right. to make a difference. The, these are two things that you must have, at, you know, up front. Mm. But also I think it's important to remain focused, mm. you know, on, on what you what you want to do. Um, many people will tell you that, oh, you're a woman, this is a difficult field, you don't think you can do it. I don't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you don't <laughs> listen to that. I mean, I don't think that that is what should stop you. You know, as women, I think uh, even in our homes, you know, we, we're trying to make a difference every day. <laughs> it's like normal life for right. us. So um, I think uh, um, uh, students out there, you know, should always remember that every single person can do something to change, mm. to change the world. We can do something. It may look 
big, it may look difficult, it may, it, but it is possible. It is mm. possible and uh, this is the advice I would, um, I would give, you know, be interested in what you are doing, be interested, equip yourself and that is why I mean, learn everything you want, you should know mm -hmm. about it, you know, equip yourself. I, I don't know how better to put it, I always yeah. say <laughs> equip yourself. But I think this is important and, and remain focused. And it's remain possible. Focused. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fatuba and yeah. Suda, for being with us, for participating in these global law talks, yeah. and for coming to Washington University School of Law. Thank, thank you very much. As I said, it's a, really been a pleasure for me, and I am very deeply humbled by, in being the person chosen <laughs> to be the fourth recipient of the of the award of uh, World Peace Through Law Award. Well, we keep yeah. looking forward to your future career and I, I think it's been a meteoric rise thus far yeah. and we look forward to following your future developments. Thank you very much. Thank Bella. you. Thank you.